I mean, if you could think of any business to be in in 2020, it definitely wasn't women's work apparel. And yet that is, that is the business that we have. And so it was just a lot of ingenuity. Hi everyone, it's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I am so excited to have my next guest here. We have Sarah LaFleur, who is the founder and CEO of MM LaFleur, which is this incredible, incredible clothing apparel, women's clothing apparel company. Uh, but we're gonna hear a lot more about her founding story and some of the, uh, the goods, the bads, all the challenges along the way. Uh, and what I thought was really, really interesting and sort of the, the early founding stories is she is the daughter of a diplomat. Um, and uh, before her philanthropic work with refugees, uh, she, or that's what she was doing before founding her own company and then wor working and moving into New York City and working in private equity. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And, uh, and how she got started and I guess ended up teaming up with the former head designer from Zach Posen. I mean, that, that is uh, in and of itself must have been so much fun and, and uh, huge coup to be able to uh, get that all together too. So Sarah has earned many accolades as well, including the Fashion Group International's Rising Star Award. Uh, Inks Design Award and Bottomless Closet Fashion Award, one of my favorite ones. Um, and she was also uh, named on the list of the WWDs, 40 of Tomorrow and Crane's 40 Under 40. Uh, so many incredible, incredible accolades. I won't name them all, but definitely M.M. LaFleur is an innovative brand, um, amazing, amazing. Uh, things and I'm excited to have you here, Sarah. Thank you so much. What a what a glorious introduction! And I would have to say, all thanks to uh, my publicist Courtney. <laughs> so she's a she's Her really um, yeah exactly. So so we have this connection. So fun. So talk to me a little bit about uh, being the daughter of a diplomat. Did you always say, I'm gonna go be an entrepreneur? Or what, what did you think you were gonna do? No, I mean, I, so, you know, in some ways, I guess the apple did not fall far from the tree because my mother is also an entrepreneur, but I actually, I think growing up, she was the black sheep in the family. Almost everyone in, the, in my family was a civil servant um, or worked in government in some shape or form. So I actually thought like, that's the job that most people have. And my mother was this kind of oddball who decided to go start her own business. And I think growing up watching her, it just looked incredibly hard from the outside. Um, actually one of the first, uh, in, in the first few years of her running her company, she had a, she had like a, a catalog order business um, where she was basically introducing catalogs. This is like, I want to say the, the, early 90s uh so she was introducing american catalogs to the japanese audience so if you can kind of remember j crew or hannah anderson or there was a, a brand called cw they yeah. that was my personal favorite cw girls anyway she would take these catalogs she would send them to japan and people would place orders and then we would get boxes and boxes delivered to our basement which was my mom's um office and then she would repackage them and ship them to Japan and, you know, manage returns, et cetera. And I, I just, I, I could see up close what a struggle it was. Um, you know, I think my mom also got a lot of joy out of it, uh, but how hard it was. And, and I think I didn't feel like it was call. you know, I felt no calling towards entrepreneurship. Um, if anything, I thought I was going to, you know, follow my dad's footsteps and, I maybe become a diplomat. I, I really just thought I was going to go work in government. Um, so you know, it was a, it's a strange turn of events. Where exactly were you living to in Japan? Gosh, you know, all over. So in Japan, we lived in Tokyo mainly. And actually, um, we often lived with my grandparents. Um, we, uh, especially because sometimes when my dad would, uh, you know, receive a tour uh, in a country, 
that my parents didn't necessarily want to raise me and my sister. They also really wanted my sister and I to have a, a Japanese education. So we, I actually went to a just a regular Japanese um, primary school, elementary school, and then middle school, uh, and as did my sister. And uh, and so, you know, I, I think I, for all intents and purposes, I, I considered myself Japanese. Uh, and it really wasn't until college um, when I that was my second time living in America, coming to college. Um, did I actually, I think, you know, think of myself as American? Um, but I, I, you know, I think even before American, I, I do think of myself as uh, immigrant, and, and I guess also, you know, somewhat, somewhat international, and also, um, you know, without a home, without a maybe like a a, a a strong, strong identity, one way or the other. So interesting. So after you left college, was your what was your first job? Well, actually, the first job I got after college was as a bike tour guide in Paris. Um, Paris was my birth country, I or it. I should say, birth city. Yeah. So I decided, okay, you know, I should I should go I should go learn about my my birth country. So I I, I moved to France for a year and um, worked under the table uh, uh, at a bike tour company, uh, among other things. But then. Came back to New York City. It's time to get a, a grown-up job, and so that grown-up job uh, was working in management consulting uh, at Bain and Company. Um, so I was there for about three years, basically, uh, starting in 2007. So interesting. And then, what did you do after that? Um, let's see. You know, I, I mentioned wanting to work in government, and I think at that point I had kind of dabbled in various opportunities. I think through Bain, I had an opportunity to go work for New York City. Um, before that, in college, I had an opportunity to go volunteer in Zambia. And I think through Bain, I, I, I thought, okay, this is actually my moment after having been in the private sector for three years to give, you know, nonprofit or, uh, yeah, go governmental work another try. I ended up moving to South Africa. I um, uh, joined a NGO called uh, TechnoServe, um, oh. which was a, uh, a nonprofit organization that focused on um, really looking at the supply chain, often in agriculture, and saying, okay, how can we incorporate, um, you know, the rural poor people at the bottom of the pyramid into the formal supply chain? And so um, I was looking at farming, really farming in, in South Africa, seeing, you know, how can we actually plug in um, rural South Africans into this economy. Uh, and I, I tried that for about a year, really, really enjoyed the work. I think ultimately, for many reasons, decided that this was not where I wanted to be. And then kind of in a, a bizarre turn of events, went and chased my, what I thought was another dream job of mine, which was working in private equity um, back in New York City. So that was when I was 27. Uh, uh, I moved back to New York City. So interesting. And so you're working in private equity. Were you focused on apparel or what was kind of the, uh, what, what was your focus in private equity? No, yeah, uh, not at all apparel. I mean, I think even at this stage, I, I didn't think that that was, you know, a, a, something that I wanted to do. Um, but it was a, a firm that did a lot of real estate um, and a lot of uh, brands. And so I um, had the opportunity to uh, basically accompany my, my boss um, and, and take a close look at the brands that they had acquired and see if there was an opportunity to, you know, turn them around or improve them even further. Um, and actually, the, the job itself I, I thought was really fascinating. It was like the first time I think in my career where I got a taste of, you know, the the excitement of running a brand. Um, and I, I, you know, even though um, that job ended up not being a long term thing for me, I I loved the content of the work. Um, this idea of like really like embracing a brand, loving a brand, loving the customers, loving the product and, and, you know, basically making the pieces come together to really to, to let that company sing. Uh, so that, that was my, that was my, my brush with private equity. Interesting. And so what do you think? I always, uh, 
I interviewed another guest who had come from private equity, and I'm curious to hear your response on this. With private equity, um, I mean, so many founders are, you know, they're just going out and searching for money, as I always share with uh, founders, it's just, there's just different types of money um, that is out there. What do you think the mindset is of private equity, having worked inside of there versus like founders? I mean, now that you've been a founder and, you know, you see f founders coming in and and uh, obviously passionate and, and what, what do you... What do you think? I mean, what what is, and again, this is a broad stroke on it, not every single private, but in general, what is private equity for those who might not know, founders who are sure. listening to the podcast? You know, I think just like most things, there are kind of extraordinary private equity firms that are mm -hmm. really there to support the original mission and enable the company to grow way faster and much bigger than I think in sometimes even the founder's imagination. Um, I think in many cases that's, that's not true. I think private equity is a very numbers driven world and there's a very, f there's a finite time to turn around a company or, you know, take it from one valuation to the next in order to be able to sell it to its next owner or take it public. And so I think the truth is it's caused a lot of damage uh, mm -hmm. to a lot of businesses. You know, I mm -hmm. think um, most of us have heard about severely leveraged companies um, and these leveraged buyouts that a lot of private, private companies, uh, private equity companies have done. They, they, um, make the company take on a ton of debt to the point where its survivability is, is really just not viable. And they cut costs at all expenses at all expense. Sometimes I think killing so much of the good with it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I, I think, I think what often happens is private equity firms come in and they, they want to put in their own management fair, but I think, uh, sometimes, you know, they, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I, 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 maybe, you know, I should say I've, I've met some great private equity firms and I've met some not so great private equity firms. Um, and I think a, a cautious skepticism is, is, um, is maybe the, the way I, I approach every conversation. Um, and really at the end of the day, I think it, it's about partnership. And I, I could say the same thing about, you know, VC investors, thankfully, I, I shopped around a lot and, um, and met incredible investors. Uh, and I, I really like my VC investors. I like everyone on my board. And I, I realize that I'm, I'm in a pretty fortunate position to be able to say that because a lot of my founder friends are not in that situation. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's, uh, I think sometimes being on sort of the other side allows you a lot of, uh, you know, you can sit there and watch and, and uh, I, more than anything, I think private equity typically is on a timeline. I mean, I think most of them are on some kind of a timeline in order to do something, like you said, either an IPO or sell a company or, and uh, oftentimes I think it's mis misalignment and uh, along the way, but I think it must have been fascinating sitting inside of a private equity to really learn that firsthand. It, totally. And you know what? One thing I think, to be clear, I'm a first time founder and a first time operator. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think like my first job was my first, you know, professional job was in consulting. And then my next job was in investing. And then now being on the operating side, I kind of laugh at my, my earlier self because I'm like, everything is very easy when it's in a spreadsheet. Everything is very easy when it's on PowerPoint. You try actually operating and executing. Um, and I was actually talking to an investment banker, I remember a couple of years ago, and he was like, you know, he was looking at our financial projections and he was like, you know, Sarah, I think if you could just take your revenue up a little bit and, and take your costs down, then you could get to profitability. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, you think I don't know that? Like, of course I can do that to my spreadsheet. I can do, I can make my spreadsheet say whatever it wants or whatever we want to say. But that's just not how operating works. Operating is about 
people management. It's about alignment. It's about execution, you know. And I, totally. I just kind of laughed. Um, but I'm sure I was the one saying that only a few years ago. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I understand why it might seem so easy on paper. No, definitely. And I, I think that it's, uh, yeah, when, and, and especially when you haven't operated a company and you haven't seen the things that you've seen and, and had to deal with, you know, different challenges along the way, for sure. I, I completely agree with you on, on so many levels. So you entered into the fashion industry. So were you sitting inside of your role there in private equity thinking one day I'm going to go and be an entrepreneur. Were you there yet? Or, or how did this come no. about? Oh my gosh. No, not at all. I, I, um, my plan was, you know, kind of typical, um, associate at a private equity firm. I was going to do my two years or however many, um, you know, years that you kind of put in to private equity and then go to business school. And then I don't know, I thought, then we'll see. Um, and then I think to make, again, a very long story short, it didn't work out at this private equity company. I, I actually um, really was so depressed being there. Um, I gave my notice and two weeks later I was out and I kind of sat on my sofa and um, cried for a good month. Uh, just feeling actually really shattered by the experience. It sounds so dramatic when I, when I just explain it quickly, but um, it was a really, really trying time, I think, in my my professional life, but really, like in my 20s, my professional life was my life, and so sure. uh, I think I, I came, I, I just kind of unraveled um, and really, you know, was doing a lot of soul searching about what it is that I wanted to do um, at, at this particular moment, and I, you know, I interviewed at a few things, but I think my biggest fear at that point was that um, I had ruined a perfectly good resume, um, and because I had left a job so quickly, nobody was going to hire me next. Um, you know, I say these things, and in retrospect, I realized that was probably not the case. Somebody would have hired me, but I thought, okay, like if nobody's going to hire me, I'm going to have to make my own job. Um, and I had always had this idea that you know, women's clothing, and at this at the time when we started the company, really women's professional wear could be done better. Um, that was an idea that was kind of floating in my head or had been floating in my head for a few years, but I just thought it was it was something, you know, it was a little bit of a pipe dream. I, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll get a chance to do it one day somehow. Um, and then suddenly when I found myself jobless and um, my savings account draining, I thought, okay, like, you know, this is an idea that I've had. I, I, why not give it a try? And so, you know, it wasn't like, I didn't start it really thinking like, okay, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. I'm gonna have a, a fashion brand. It was really, okay, here's an idea that I'm passionate about because I'm a cu customer and I, I personally feel this pain. I don't have anything else to do. And, you know, my my professional prospects can't really get any worse, so why not give it a try? I mean, it was, it was you know, it was that mentality. It was that simple. And yeah. did you, so what was kind of the first step what did, how did you think of, I mean, obviously your, your thoughts on maybe I should go do this and maybe I should change this industry, but I, like, at what point did you decide, okay, I'm going to go and, you know, build a website or, or, you know, get a business license or like, what, what were those steps that you really said, okay, I'm going to do this first. You know, actually the first thing that I did, believe it or not, was rent a WeWork space. This was like, I think back when WeWork only had two buildings or something, but I rented a tiny office uh, for $500 and I gave it up two months later because I was like, I can't afford $500. But that was the first thing that I did. And I do remember filing to start a business, you know, be very easy. I just created a, an LLC in Delaware, which is actually... Um, Delaware is, is still where we're incorporated. We're no longer um, an LLC, but uh, you know that was kind of an amazing thing. I think just coming from other countries and and having friends in a lot of different places, just realizing how easy it is in America in some ways to start a company. You know, okay, of course, like it's not that funding comes easy. Um, you know, maybe there are a lot of challenges, but the the paperwork was surprisingly easy and i think at the time i had a friend 
um, who was living in Nigeria, who was telling me about how he was having to, you know, pay bribes in order to like pass through some paperwork. Um, and so that was, you know, strangely a moment where I was, I found myself very proud to be an American. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, um, so anyway, that, that, that paperwork, you know, happened pretty quickly. And then really the first, I think, big step that I took after that was, was trying to find my co-founder and, you know, as you could probably tell from what we've been discussing, like I'm, I'm the money person. I, I'm also the customer, but I'm, I'm, you know, my background was in business. So, um, I really wanted to find a, a partner who was an amazing designer. Um, and I think my mother, you know, before having started her, her own company had been in the world of high end fashion. And so she had kind of taught me through the clothes that she would bring home, you know, what good tailoring looked like, what great fabrics felt like. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the whole question that I was, you know, I wanted to answer was like, can I deliver this level of quality clothing? If I go direct to consumer, if I cut out the middleman, if I get fabrics directly from the mills in Italy and Germany and Japan and make them at some of the best factories that we know, you know, can I deliver excellent quality, beautiful tailoring to, to professional women? Um, and for that, I really needed, you know, a talented designer. Um, and I didn't know anybody in the design world, like literally not a single person in the design world. Um, but it was through a college friend who happened to go to interior design school, who happened to have a friend who worked in fashion design, who happened to introduce me to a headhunter. And he was the one who actually introduced me to my co-founder, Miyako, who I've now been in business with for 10 plus years. But um, it came about in this really roundabout way. She was, as you said, Kara, you know, the former head designer at Zach Posen, really just an incredible talent. Um, and so, you know, were it not for her, this business definitely wouldn't be around. Um, and, you know, I think so much of our success is really as a result of her design talent. That's amazing. And so you started out in, you know, really kind of business clothing for women. Uh, we've obviously been through an incredibly crazy couple of years, almost a couple of years now, I guess not quite. Uh, but feels like a couple of years, oh, but it does, doesn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it really does. What have you learned about this consumer? I mean, obviously we're not going into the office, um, quite yet for, for most people and, and coming off of the summer as well. But, uh, and I, I think you're also moving into more n lifestyle clothing, uh, too. So talk to me a little bit about how the pandemic really kind of shifted your business in that. Yeah. Respect. I, I mean, I won't mince words. It was incredibly, incredibly hard in 2020. I would even say early 2021. Um, you know, we, we saw, I think we saw what we call our customer, Samantha. Um, and so we saw Samantha's, I think, lifestyle and preferences evolving just even before the pandemic, you know, we saw workwear becoming more casual and that she wanted more stretch, um, in her pants. And she wanted, we always stood for, I think, comfort and machine washability, wrinkle resistance. But I think in many ways, so we were, we felt like we were ahead of the curve on, on that aspect, mm -hmm. but then just in terms of, you know, our biggest business prior to the pandemic was dresses and nobody was wearing dresses last year. And, and that was really hard on our business. Um, you know, we closed all of our stores, uh, and we had to furlough and then lay off a good number of our retail employees. Uh, and it was, it, they were really, really challenging times. Um, you know, I think, uh, for most of last year and the beginning of this year, the goal was just survival. Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of retailers go out of business. And so, you know, it was a scary time. Um, I think what got me through it, I would say like emotional, it, like it, it was definitely a scary times for the business, but emotionally it strangely did not feel like the hardest time for me. And I think I owe that to like really having an amazing, um, executive team, amazing partners, like around the circle who I, who I felt like I could share things with and talk about really openly. I think 
Um, and you know, we really, we, we got to the other side. We, we've, we survived and actually, you know, it's September. We are, we're having our best month of revenue since, since the beginning of COVID. Um, we just opened back up our New York store. DC is already open. Um, so the, the momentum is really starting to build back up and, and we're looking to open, you know, five to six more new stores, uh, next year. So I'm, I feel I think just extraordinarily, extraordinarily proud of my team. I mean, if you could think of any business to be in in 2020, it definitely wasn't women's work apparel, and yet yeah. that is that is the business that we have, right? And so, um, it was just a lot of ingenuity. One of the things that we did, we launched virtual appointments, and so um, you know our store stylists are kind of famous for doing these one-on-one -on -one appointments with our customers where they pre-pull items for her um, and you you basically work with a stylist to fit uh, to figure out what works best for you and, and we move that over to Zoom um, and now that's one of our fastest growing revenue channels and um, we started a, a customer slack channel and customers would hop on every morning and we became their new quote-unquote work wives work husbands um, they were sharing childcare tips with each other uh, so I think there was a lot of um, a lot of creativity that came out of this period. But you know, as a business owner, tough, yeah. and uh, I learned a lot from it. Do you feel like the community around uh, you know the industry as a whole? I it, you know it's interesting. I I talk a lot about this in in my book as well. That I I came from the tech industry, and when I came into the beverage industry, I I wasn't shy about asking a lot of food and beverage people how to do things and you know many of them wouldn't give me any time because why would they I, I came from I was coming from a totally different industry I had this idea that in maybe in some ways they found competitive right uh, it, and it was um, it was really lonely in many ways uh, you know as I kind of look back on on that time and so then I just started to do it and build it over time and kind of I think be the person that um, I wanted to be, uh, or I wanted in, in my network, which was much more, you know, mentorship and and kind of saying you can go do this, et cetera. I wish I had more time to do a lot of those things, but especially during this challenging time, do you feel like the apparel industry, like, do you feel like you were able to reach out to other people, or is it still very siloed as a, you know, as an industry? You know, surprisingly, yes, it was, uh, it was kind of unlike any other time in the sense that everyone was desperate to help each other out. So That's whether great. it was around, um, the paycheck protection program, right. uh, that was, you know, a huge help to our business. And I know many other retail businesses and, um, you know, my, my founder friends and I would ha hop on zoom. And I think there were a couple of um, women that I know who are in retail, but also just generally consumer products um, because, you know, it, and actually it was interesting. I think we initially all took a hit, but then, for example, the home industry came back really quickly and then, you know, did even better uh, than than year prior, whereas apparel really continued to um, kind of stay um, flat if you were lucky, but, but yeah. often, you know, kind of drop off and and we were really open about that struggle uh and i would say like there 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 have been other moments in the business that were challenging and i didn't feel nearly as comfortable i think talking about it with other people because i felt like i was the only one going through it now of course in retrospect we we share these stories and we realize wow like we were all going through the same things or we were totally. all struggling yeah. right um, but there was like, there wasn't an embarrassment about, I think, sharing it because the factors felt so like macro and out of our control. Um, but that is a, that is a lesson that I, I am taking with me, which is like, there's just really trying to, um, reach out more, I think be, be more vulnerable, um, with, with my, my kind of fellow fellow founders, I think probably, I think, I think if, if anything, I'm probably, I overshare sometimes. And so yeah. I, I always have to watch myself, but, um, for me, it was a, a huge source of comfort. I love it. That's so great. So 
for any entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about switching industries, uh, starting their own business, uh, you know, what do you wish that someone would have said to you uh, early on? Or what do you know now that, that maybe, I mean, you've learned so much along the way for sure. What do you know now that, that you wish you would have known when you started? Uh, that it was gonna take a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we, we kind of glorify founders and founding stories, at least that are told where things really feel like an overnight success. You know, Instagram comes to mind because I think, I think they sold their company within, I don't know, it was like something crazy, like within 24 months of founding it. But that's not those how very rare. Is, very yeah. rare, right? Very rare. And yet, for some reason, those are the stories that get told a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's this real uh, misconception in the world of, of entrepreneurship. And I, I would say, like, in two years, I think I had launched, I had, I had just launched my site um, since basically beginning to, to launch. You know, it, it took roughly a little under, but it took almost two years to get the product ready and then to launch the site. And I think coming from management consulting or, or, or finance where, you know, things work at breakneck speed and your product, frankly, is, you know, uh, like in the case of consulting, PowerPoint or in the case sure. of finance, you know, a transaction um, product is difficult and incredibly challenging. And I mean, Kara, you know this, too. I, and you have also, you know, you pr you produce things that people consume. So they, they have to meet all sorts of stringent standards. Mm -hmm. Those things take a lot of time. And I think sometimes I, I meet um, MBAs, like during their summer internships, they'll come and intern with us or, or um, people who have other side jobs or main jobs and are trying to start this on the side. And they say, okay, well, I'm going to give this like, you know, the summer to, to work on my, my company. And if I don't see any traction by the fall, then I'm just going to start interviewing for, you know, normal, normal jobs, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try this for a year, but if it doesn't work out, I'm going to go back to my, my last job. And I'm thinking like, that is nowhere nearly enough time. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, it, it takes a long time to, to start a company. And so, um, I always say like, get a side hustle, you know, don't, don't quit your job thinking, okay, I have like X thousand in savings and I'm just going to go through this. And whenever I'm, I'm done with this money, that means like by the time, by that time, my company must be successful or else, because I think nobody ever makes that makes it, you know, within yeah, that time true. frame. So I was tutoring. Um, that's how, that was my side, side hustle for the two, first two and a half years. That's how I made ends meet, um, while also working on starting my business. And, uh, I think it just, you know, it takes time. Well, and I think that is such a key thing that you said. I think taking time, um, and I would say that that's, that's really uh, something that I've learned over time, that when I did actually take my time to do things uh, and, you know, gave it a rest and not tried to rush it, those were really the best experiences because so often when we're rushing things, there are things that are out of our control. Certainly, you know, this pandemic, I think, especially if you're manufacturing outside of the US, I mean, we're on a different time schedule in different parts of the world and there's only so much you can do. So I think take some deep breaths and know like when you can't push anymore and it just is what it is. And you've definitely learned that firsthand. And I think that the more we can all look at sort of our challenging times throughout um, our life, our, our business journey too, those things are gonna help us to actually do better in the future next time we're dealing with with uh, challenging times. So, well, this is amazing, amazing, so educational, Sarah, and obviously an incredible product. I wish you guys all the best and everybody. Thank you, Kara. Uh, yeah, and where can everybody um, reach out to MM LaFleur and where's the best place to connect with you all? Sure. So first of all, if you're based in New York City or DC, please stop by one of our stores. We're in Bryant Park. If you're in New York City, um, we're two blocks from the White House. If you're in Washington, DC, otherwise mmlafleur.com is, you know, your best option. Uh, and you can also book a virtual appointment, which is what I would highly recommend, uh, and meet one of our fabulous stylists. Uh, there's no cost, uh, 
And there's no expectation to purchase, just hopefully a chance to learn more about our collection and find what works perfectly for you, um, whether you're going back to the office or not, since we have a lot, a lot of uh, clothes just like that that I think fit uh, the modern woman's lifestyle. They're amazing. And uh, Sierra was so nice to send me sweater and pants, and they're amazing. They're, they're adorable, and I can't wait to w I'm actually going out to dinner tonight, and I am going to wear them tonight, and they're super terrific. And so thank you again. I really, really appreciate it. So uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We're here every Monday and Wednesday for the Kara Golden Show, talking to amazing founders and CEOs who are sharing their stories, sharing their challenging times, and letting us know a little bit more what goes on behind the brand and, and building uh, terrific brands and getting through challenging times. And hopefully you all will uh, go to M.M. LaFleur and also follow Sarah uh, on her social too at Sarah LaFleur and uh, thank you everyone for coming on hopefully you're all drinking a bottle of hint and hopefully you'll get a chance to read my book if you have not already called Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters and thank you so much Sarah I really really appreciate it and everybody give Sarah's episode five stars and download the app and all of that stuff so thanks everyone have a great rest of the week